Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Assistant Director of the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these history hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great work being done by folks who have used the historical collections in the Hagley Library for research, supported by grants and fellowships of different kinds from the Hagley Center. One such scholar joins me today. Moiko Yamasaki is a PhD candidate at the University of Oregon. Moiko, thanks for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me today. Oh, you're very welcome. Let's by, uh, start by painting with broad strokes, so to speak. What is it you're researching and writing about? So I'm writing about this organization called Council for a uh, Union Free Movement, Union Free Environment, which started in 1970, uh, 70, sorry, 77. Um, and it um, they officially ended their um, existence in 1994. Um, and it's basically an organization to educate uh, industrial managers on the techniques um, of like countering unions in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And this organization, its purpose was to counter um, union organizations, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, who was running this organization? Uh, so it was a subsidiary of National Association of Manufacturers. Sure, and the NAM records are held here at, at the Hagley Library. Exactly, it was very helpful. Yes. Oh sure. Uh, well, what is it that you're uh, interested about? Um, this what was it? The Union for um, Organization for Union Free Environment. Yeah, so union free environment is basically a euphemism. And um, although they quite strongly disagree that they are a union busting organization, but what they were doing was uh, just exchanging information that what technique worked and not worked uh, to prevent uh, unions from getting organized in the workplace. So it's like an educational organization, um, and they were not really like doing anything political or like anything like lobbying or any legislative effort, but they were really focused on, on exchanging information among managers. I see. What are some of the techniques that they recommended for managers to counter union organizing? Yeah, so what's interesting about this organization is that they really um, try to prevent unions from coming to the workplace. So not really even like they didn't want unions to even start organizing drives in the workplace. So they really focus on the techniques, management techniques to cultivate employment employees uh, loyalty to the organization, to a company and make sure that everyone is happy in the workplace so that they never uh, you know, go out to like contact the union and bring them in the workplace. Hmm. So the notion was to prevent uh, organizing from even beginning. Exactly. So that's why they called it like union free, uh, just never have a union. I see. Well, what were some of the firms that they were um, trying to push this message to? Um, sorry, can I repeat the question again? Sure. Uh, what were some of the firms that um, this organization was trying to educate, so to speak? Yes. So um, they actually opened the membership to non-NAM members as well. Um, so it was not only manufacturing companies, but also service industry and, you know, um, other types of industries as well. And they had like several hundred um member companies at its peak. So it was not really uh, manufacturing, but really many other companies. Um, some of the names that I found was like FedEx um, or, uh, sorry, I can't remember <laughs> the specific names, uh, but uh, the member companies were not only big firms, but also smaller. Uh, companies who were not really like inside the you know management communication before um, management communication network before um, so that's also another interesting point of this organization. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of why it was only active for seventeen years? 
Yes, so um, it's such an irony uh, for labor historians. But so they stated uh, because you know in the seventies uh, unions were pretty active organizing you know workers who just recently entered the American workplace like women and people of color, and so union was like really active in the seventies, and that's why they felt like they really need to get organized as a class of employers. Um, and counter uh, that power. But then in the 90s, union free is not really like special. It was just not attractive to employers anymore because it was more like a norm in the 90s after, um, you know, um, like more than 10 years um, of like unions kind of declining. And that's why they became kind of decline. That's mm. cool. So their, their main goal of creating a Union free environment was largely uh, accomplished already. Accomplished, yeah. Mm-hmm. What implications for the present moment do you think that this has history may have? Yes, yeah, so um, I think a lot of companies nowadays really emphasize how they are like nice to its employees and how they care about its employees and. Like we as employees sometimes appreciate that. Um, but when we, when we think about that history behind it, um, we need to be aware that it's like a really a technique strategy by the company to uh, you know, um uh, stave off unions from the workplace. Um and it's really the sole like reason behind it, you know. It's not really they really try to make employees happy, but like they wanted to make employees happy so that employees do not get empowered by the unions. So um, I think that's really important to be aware of as employees. Um, so that's, yeah, the implication that I, mm. I think this history has. Might it be the case that as union organizing um, advances, as more union action takes place across uh, the American economy, might efforts to um, create union free environment uh, also um, it, return to the scene. Exactly. Uh, you know, when we think about the Starbucks organizing, Starbucks is a company that has been really proud of itself for like very benevolent, you know, liberal um, company that really takes care of its employees. Um, but they're also very, very anti-union. We've been, we've been seeing, you know, how anti-union they are nowadays. So it's really the, you know, two sides of the same coin, I think, like mm-hmm. being very nice to employees and then the, being very anti-union. And I think this organization really represents that history. Mm-hmm. Where do you intend to take your research, your dissertation project moving forward? Yes, so um, my dissertation project itself is actually um, about FedEx. So it's it's more like a side project, actually. Um, but um, FedEx um, history, uh, well, I started to work on this project because FedEx was also really proud of itself um, as a benevolent company. And they really emphasize their slogan is people service profit. So they they emphasize that, you know, we put people first. They are mm. like our priorities. And then I was just curious where that came from. And then I just figured out uh, there was this organization that was, you know, spreading uh, that uh, euphemism in the industries. So that's kind of how I started this project. I- I'm hoping to, you know, continue to work on my dissertation on FedEx. Um, I think this particular project, um, I'm I'm hoping to write an article um, and publish it in uh, an academic uh, journal in your future. Oh, well, what an interesting project. And Muiko, thank you very much for taking the time to share it with us. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, and the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger.